beshrew me if i think anything more requisite than silence for a man who secludes himself in order to study imagine what a variety of noises reverberates about my ears i have lodgings right over a bathing establishment so picture to yourself the assortment of sounds which are strong enough to make me hate my very powers of hearing when your strenuous gentleman for example is exercising himself by flourishing leaden weights when he is working hard or else pretends to be working i can hear him grunt and whenever he releases his imprisoned breath i can hear him panting in wheezy and high-pitched tones or perhaps i notice some lazy fellow content with a cheap rub-down and hear the crack of the pummeling hand on his shoulder varying in sound according as the hand is laid on flat or hollow then perhaps a professional comes along shouting out the score that is the finishing touch add to this the arresting of an occasional roisterer or pickpocket the racket of the man who always likes to hear his own voice in the bathroom or the enthusiast who plunges into the swimming tank with unconscionable noise and splashing besides all those whose voices if nothing else are good imagine the hair plucker with his penetrating shrill voice for purposes of advertisement continually giving it vent and never holding his tongue except when he is plucking the armpits and making his victim yell instead then the cake seller with his varied cries the sausage man the confectioner and all the vendors of food hawking their wares each with his own distinctive intonation so you say what iron nerves or deadened ears you must have if your mind can hold out amid so many noises so various and so discordant when our friend chrysippus is brought to his death by the continual good morrows that greet him but i assure you that this racket means no more to me than the sound of waves or falling water although you will remind me that a certain tribe once moved their city merely because they could not endure the din of a nile cataract words seem to distract me more than noises for words demand attention but noises merely fill the ears and beat upon them among the sounds that din round me without distracting i include passing carriages a machinist in the same block a saw sharpener near by or some fellow who is demonstrating with little pipes and flutes at the trickling fountain shouting rather than singing furthermore an intermittent noise upsets me more than a steady one but by this time i have toughened my nerves against all that sort of thing so that i can endure even a boatswain marking the time in high-pitched tones for his crew for i force my mind to concentrate and keep it from straying to things outside itself all outdoors may be bedlam provided that there is no disturbance within provided that fear is not wrangling with desire in my breast provided that meanness and lavishness are not at odds one harassing the other for of what benefit is a quiet neighborhood if our emotions are in an uproar "'Twas night, and all the world was lulled to rest. "'This is not true, for no real rest can be found "'when reason has not done the lulling. "'Night brings our troubles to the light, rather than banishes them. "'It merely changes the form of our worries. "'For even when we seek slumber, "'our sleepless moments are as harassing as the daytime. "'Real tranquility is the state reached by an unperverted mind when it is relaxed think of the unfortunate man who courts sleep by surrendering his spacious mansion to silence who that his ear may be disturbed by no sound bids the whole retinue of his slaves be quiet and that whoever approaches him shall walk on tiptoe he tosses from this side to that and seeks a fitful slumber amid his frettings he complains that he has heard sounds when he has not heard them at all the reason you ask his soul is in an uproar 
it must be soothed, and its rebellious murmuring checked. You need not suppose that the soul is at peace when the body is still. Sometimes quiet means disquiet. We must therefore rouse ourselves to action, and busy ourselves with interests that are good, as often as we are in the grasp of an uncontrollable sluggishness. Great generals, when they see that their men are mutinous, check them by some sort of labor or keep them busy with small forays. The much-occupied man has no time for wantonness, and it is an obvious commonplace that the evils of leisure can be shaken off by hard work. Although people may often have thought that I sought seclusion because I was disgusted with politics and regretted my hapless and thankless position, yet in the retreat to which apprehension and weariness have driven me, my ambition sometimes develops afresh. For it is not because my ambition was rooted out that it has abated, but because it was wearied, or perhaps even put out of temper by the failure of its plans. And so, with luxury also, which sometimes seems to have departed, and then, when we have made a profession of frugality, begins to fret us, and amid our economies seeks the pleasures which we have merely left but not condemned. Indeed, the more stealthily it comes, the greater is its force, for all unconcealed vices are less serious. A disease also is farther on the road to being cure when it breaks forth from concealment and manifests its power. So with greed ambition, and the other evils of the mind, you may be sure that they do most harm when they are hidden behind a pretense of soundness. Men think that we are in retirement, and yet we are not. For if we have sincerely retired and have sounded the signal for retreat, and have scorned outward attractions, then, as I remarked above, no outward thing will distract us. No music of men or birds can interrupt good thoughts when they have once become steadfast and sure. The mind which starts at words, or at chance sounds, is unstable and has not yet withdrawn into itself. It contains within itself an element of anxiety and rooted fear, and this makes one a prey to care, as our Virgil says. I, whom of yore no dart could cause to flee, nor Greeks with crowded lines of infantry, now shake at every sound and fear the air, both for my child and for the load I bear. This man in his first state is wise. He blenches neither at the brandished spear, nor at the clashing armor of the serried foe, nor at the din of the stricken city. This man is in his second state lacks knowledge fearing for his own concerns. He pales at every sound. Any cry is taken for the battle shout and overthrows him. The slightest disturbance renders him breathless with fear. It is the load that makes him afraid. Select any one you please from among your favorites of fortune, trailing their many responsibilities, carrying their many burdens, and you will behold a picture of Virgil's hero, fearing both for his child and for the load he bears. You may therefore be sure that you are at peace with yourself when no noise reaches you, when no word shakes you out of yourself, whether it be of flattery or of threat, or merely an empty sound buzzing about you with unmeaning din. What then, you say, is it not sometimes a simpler matter just to avoid the uproar? I admit this. Accordingly, I shall change from my present quarters. I merely wish to test myself and to give myself practice. Why need I be tormented any longer, when Ulysses found so simple a cure for his comrades, even against the songs of the sirens? Farewell. End of Letter 56 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia this LibriVox recording is in the public domain.